Things have not gone as I've expected. Hi, welcome. Spoilers, by the way. I've been reading through Egghead and I've gotten so many things wrong. Were the signs there? Yeah. Was I optimistic in denying these signs? Also, yeah. And as a result, uh, we have a lot of things to talk about. This has also been the hardest one to make because it feels like every chapter has so many changes. Let's start off with the Lulucia incident. Throughout this arc, we have found out about the Mother Flame and its absolute destructive impact and how it relates, possibly, to NS Lobby. And yet, there has been an interesting amount of revelations after this introduction. Sabo was implied to be within the blast radius of Lulucia. I didn't think Sabo would die. In the manga, it was a lot more vague, but when I got footage for the anime, it definitely looked like Sabo was in more danger uh, than he ended up being in. Because now, uh, in retrospect, not so much. He is in more of a safe distance to view the blast. Turns out Sabo and a lot of other residents from Lulucia were kind of like spectating from the side, right? It was kind of implied, for me at least, that the whole event happened very quickly. I expected like Emu crosses it out, giant beam comes from the sky, wipes everyone out before they can do anything. But these chapters imply that the Lulucia incident was a lot uh, slower and that people were able to evacuate it. It went from like, you have 30 seconds to, well, maybe you got like half an hour to escape. Speaking of the Lulucia incident, it introduced the sea level rising. It's implied that because of the Lulucia incident, the sea levels are rising, and unlike Water 7 where the blast radius of Ennis Lobby seemingly affected nearby islands like Water 7 and Long Ring Long Land, here the blast from Lulucia seems to be affecting almost every island. That is weird to me. It is either like a much bigger blast than last time, or every time that it's used, its damage scales in volume perhaps. Or maybe there are uh, even more islands that we don't know that have gone under and that is what's causing this effect. But it starts to make you wonder, will another blast outright drown everybody? Like how many times has this been used? How much collateral can another one of these beams actually do? Uh, not just to an individual island, but like to the entirety of every island. We saw an island go under. How many more times until, like, every island goes under? Um, on a, on a related note, uh, I got some, I got some bad news. It's about Vivi's dad. Vivi's dad is dead. <laughs> was I overly optimistic to assume that he was alive? Yeah. Thinking about it now, did he have a lot more to add to the story? Not really. Him learning a bit of secret exposition before dying worked narratively. It was realistically a pretty good time to wrap him up as a character. We get to like incentivize other characters to act, essentially like raising the stakes on a character that from the looks of it was already was already kind of like one foot in the grave. But from a storytelling perspective, I guess uh, I, we had to do it to him. However, I have a gripe and it's happened a few times throughout One Piece, don't get me wrong, but I've noticed it a lot more now, especially in this conversation with Emu. And also with like Sabo and Bonnie a little bit more into the story. And that's that a lot of characters really feel like they are trying to speak in riddles. I swear at least once a chapter, someone will say something in code like they totally forgot an important character's name or they don't want anyone to overhear them. More specifically, uh, they don't want us to overhear them. Because every time this happened, I kept thinking... You can just say it already. You're gonna jinx it by being vague. Stop trying to create bad opportunities for things to happen. We're not done with the Nefetari family because we got to talk about Lily Nefetari, right? In the midst of the death of Vivi's dad, we learned two things. One, Lily was the first Nefetari to go to Mary Joas before mysteriously disappearing, quote unquote, wink, wink. Which I think is very interesting because it's implied that she did something huge to just vanish. How tragic, by the way. Like, you're not even one year into the founding of the world government and you've already killed off a member. You, like, spawn camped them at the base of operations before they even got to return home to Alabasta. Uh, and two, she, along with the entire Nefetari lineage, has the will of D. Maybe the entire lineage. I don't actually... Hmm. I don't actually know that. I'm just assuming that everyone else has the D initial. Which, again, 
implies that Lily Nefertari maybe was not so cool with this whole world government plan from the start. But it very much leaves the specifics of what happened pretty vague. Like, what did she do to get the axe? We don't know. If she was there when, like, the world government was founded, did she kind of, like, create the Will of D? Is that kind of what we're implying? Does the Will of D trace back to her as, uh, like, a first founder of sorts? And then does it spread out from there? Or was Lily alongside maybe a few others who jump-started the idea and then she was just one of the earliest ones to vanish? Who knows? The only reason why I bring this up is because the only people to witness this act are Wapol and Sabo. And Wapol is frankly so interesting to me as a choice to bring back. He is a reoccurring character with connections to Vivi. He is also a character who took over a kingdom and ruled for himself. Very relevant to the story. He is used to showcase that both himself and Vivi are alive. And so as I'm talking about it, I'm realizing that Wapol has so much narrative power here. Like, Wapol and Vivi are together so that he can explain the death of Cobra to Vivi. And Wapol can explain that Vivi has the will of D. Not just to Vivi, by the way, but to the world via the bird. That's messed up, man. Uh, he has a name. He, I, he told us his name like a few chapters ago. The bird. You know him. The, the news bird. So I think it is fascinating how much Wapol was utilized in this arc. Sabo, on the other hand, was told to directly tell Luffy that he shares the Will of D with Vivi, which I think is also interesting. It implies a few things. It implies that they're going to meet up at one point and that Luffy will be able to use this information somehow. Realistically, I'm going to be real. I think that you would tell Luffy, hey, we both have the D initial. And I don't think he would even know what to do with that info. Luffy might be like, oh yeah, I guess you're right. But also, what do you do with that information? We know that the Will of D means that people will turn against the world government, but like, so? People who don't have the Will of D turn against the government. To me, this says more that like the Will of D is important within the story, not because it means that Vivi will turn against the world government or anything, but rather because I think that it implies that the founder of the Will of D or the history behind it will be useful evidence to overthrow the world government by revealing more truths about the world. So in my eyes, I think it's possible for Wapol to be the only one to spread information about Emu and all the corruption from inside, which will then go to Morgan, which will then go to the world. Now, when will this happen? I think it's a bit trickier because one, Wapol's not really a fan of this whole idea. He doesn't really want to even be here. Wapol did not seem at all interested in spewing anything. But two, if we did spew any information to Morgan, I feel like Morgan would keep that information more in the back of his pocket for whenever the stars align. As a side note, while we're talking about Emu, there's a lot of small points that have been implied for a while now, but I like that they are being talked about here as a way to get you to really think about them. Like how, as everyone at the Revolutionary Army is speculating about Emu, someone mentions Law's Fruit and its ability to grant someone immortality. And subsequently, how the only way to know that someone could be granted immortality was if someone was granted immortality. Another thing that we got to think about was how the Revolutionary Army uh, was talking about ancient weapons, how the entire outcome of Lulucia might have been the source of an ancient weapon. And if that's the case, it brings up the idea that the world government might have more ancient weapons. They've been around for a long time. Like, objectively, they've had time to look around. And from what's implied, the problem with ancient weapons isn't necessarily how difficult they are to find, but rather that they have limitations, like a fuel source or a specific condition that is needed to activate it. And if they don't have that, maybe it's just up in Mary Joe's, hidden away. We're talking a lot about Mary Joas, Marie Joa. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and say it. The Reverie sucked. That's right. I'm going to go out and say it. The Reverie, from its conception, was planned to fail. The more I think about the Reverie, the more I realize how bad of an idea it was. I still think it's funny that the Reverie quite literally means an impractical idea. 
but also how bad it was to have celestial dragons nearby, how dangerous it is to have many political leaders all in one room with high tensions, how throughout this entire thing people tried to capture Shirohoshi, and how other kings and soldiers had to step in because no one in the world government stopped it. Like, immediately, everyone should have been like, oh, Shirohoshi's top priority, like, everyone needs to protect her. Half the people don't even see her as, like, a person, and the other half are objectively against her. Because it wasn't like a one-time thing. It continuously happened to the point where everyone, objectively, like everyone in the entire reverie, knew that she was in danger. Everyone in the reverie knew that not only Fishman, but like everyone that went to the reverie was not welcomed here. How no one was an ally or even had positive intentions towards you. And how one of the only people who had any power to actually stop that violence, um is now dead. Like, that within itself is crazy to me. Like, what are the rules when one person imposes their will on another? Because of anything, you would think the person who started it, the person who tried to capture Shirahoshi, that that person would be the one to get in trouble. Not the one who tried to stop it, right? But just everything, everything went so wrong. And like, what a tragic character arc for a celestial dragon who tried to like change their ways even slightly and did something correct for like the first time in his life and then he's just gone he's dead like that is messed up he got uh he got butchered by one of the god knights um i think this is the first time that we've been introduced to the god knights but conceptually it's weird the god knights are like the ones who protect the celestial dragons i think but this is the first time that we've ever seen them so maybe they're just in Mary Joas, or maybe the God Knights only protect Mary Joas, or maybe the God Knights only protect Emu, and that's why they're in Mary Joas? And then we get some like weird lore with this knight when we learn that he was a former king of God Valley. So did God Valley get destroyed and he moved over here to become a knight? Is he called the God's Knight because he was in God Valley? And was he also a part of the entire fight that went down? in God Valley. I don't know. That's very vague. There's there's so many questions there. Let's move over to Kuma and Bonnie. I um I feel conflicted about this section. I feel conflicted about so much of what's been happening in Egghead so far. With the Kuma and Bonnie section specifically, we simultaneously got a lot of info and not that much info. And the thing is, I feel like we only scratched the surface of what we got from Kuma. And now we're moving on. And I'm not sure if we're going to be able to revisit the story beat, at least until we're off of Egghead. What do I mean? Well, in these chapters, Bonnie is seen running through Vegapunk's lab and runs into Kuma's Papa ability. Because Kuma's ability not only has the ability to grant physical damage, but also emotional damage. As a side note, I love when the fruits get stretched to like their furthest conceptual edges. The Papa fruit not just being able to reflect damage, but also emotions, memory, humanity itself. It's very fitting. And I like that it's something that Vegapunk himself pushes Kuma to experiment with. The idea that you can just unlock new methods of an ability through experimentation. The memory itself is extremely short. It is a flashback of child Kuma being abused by the world government, and admittedly, it is sad. Objectively, I don't know how much I can really pull from that. I think that this flashback is here to demonstrate that Kuma had very negative interactions with celestial dragons, which led him to become a revolutionary, which made him struck a deal with Vegapunk, and that is why he is climbing the red wall right now. Maybe as an attempt to get revenge, maybe as a way to steal information, but this flashback uh, d didn't really give us anything to latch on to that we didn't already know. I want to talk about, like, the heart of Egghead. The backstabbery that has been afoot in all of these chapters that I've read. What I find interesting about Egghead is that it feels like sides don't matter as much. And I like that. People who are... Previously, once enemies are now allies, Seraphims go back and forth between helping and attacking the Straw Hats. 
CP0 goes around strategically trying to take out the most influential people in order to get the Seraphims to follow their orders. The Vegapunk clones cannot be trusted. Stussy attacks CP0 from the inside. It is such a chaotic gray area. It's fascinating. One of the bigger hooks from Egghead was the mystery plotline where not only are a few people missing, but we also got a mysterious someone within this arc pulling a few strings, and that someone being York, the Vegapunk clone. And this just goes without saying, like this solidifies the act that you should never make a clone. In media, a clone is like your biggest enemy. They are bound to sabotage you like 90% of the time. But this backstabbery specifically brought some weird questions I didn't consider. At first I thought that it surely can't be one of Vegapunk's clones because, well, everyone gets their memories uploaded to the cloud, so shouldn't you know who the traitor was? But later, we learned that clones can choose not to upload their memories to the cloud. Is that weird? Is that an option that you would expect Vegapunk to do? I assumed that he wouldn't do that. Throughout this entire arc, I've been trying to figure out the ethics of Vegapunk, and letting clones choose what memories Vegapunk can access did not really align with what I thought of him. Given how he made clones specifically to act differently in order to get a variety of experiences, I just assumed that he'd want to transfer everything over, regardless of the ethics. And if he did that, it would have been easier to know who took down practically all of Cyberpol. It's almost more impressive that it wasn't Vegapunk himself that took down all of Cypherpole, but a single version of Vegapunk. And not only did that single version of Vegapunk take down Cypherpole, but that no other version realized that she took down every Cypherpole number out. Like, good job. That's cool. So why'd York do this? Why is she backstabbing people? So York made a deal with the world government that she could become a celestial dragon, which, I mean, I assume that would be difficult to make happen. But then again, uh, you, you can just lie. You can pretend to be in someone's family. You can pretend to be your own family that has been there totally for all of time. Like there are so many celestial dragons. Surely you could dump someone in there and what, you're gonna question a celestial dragon? Like, hey, it could work. And in exchange for becoming a celestial dragon, she would create the mother flame, the power source of this like giant beam. How did she manage to negotiate all of this without anyone finding out is beyond me. Impressive. You weren't even like the smart one. I, well, that's, you know, that's rude. You were intended to be like gluttony and something else. I'm not fixing this, am I? To me, what makes York interesting is how she is a version of Vegapunk. Like, yeah, they're all clones and they're all Vegapunk and they're all like exaggerated emotionally to the ninth degree. But that essentially makes each clone the endpoint of how Vegapunk would react. The good clone is an extension of Vegapunk's good intentions. Similarly, the bad clone is an extension of how far and angry Vegapunk might be if he was able to fully commit to all of his bad intentions. And York seems to be pushing out the worst of what Vegapunk would be capable of. Self-sabotage and greed in an effort to become something that he himself knows is a bad thing. That makes York a really interesting character, but it also makes Vegapunk a really interesting character, by extension. As for the actual fights that happened on Egghead, look, I'm not much of a power skill guy, alright? I see someone do a punch and I'm like, that's a good punch. Uh, I don't have a lot to say. They were cool. Here's some of my reactions to seeing these chapters animated when I was gathering footage. He did not have to take the shirt off. Oh, that's cool though. He's such a little goober. Oh, weird. They're not even like, it's not even black. It's like a purplish blue. <laughs> Bam. Oh, look at that. The animation's gorgeous. Very interesting reactions. I know. So we have been hyping up the fight between Luffy and Luchi and it ended prematurely. And that was really painful. I hope that it's not the end of it. I hope we get a round three eventually because we've been hyping it for so long. And come on, we barely saw anything. Maybe Luchi will go in uh, solo next time, considering he didn't really agree with anyone in Egghead. He disobeyed so many orders. Also, Zoro versus Mihawk. Gasp. It happened. Kind of. 
I think that it would be funny if we just never saw Zoro fight Mihawk uh, ever again and Power Scalers only had this moment to point to for any clarification. Mihawk dies to um to like Emu or something. Not even a Shanks battle. We just never find out any of the answers. I think that would be hilarious. But they were very enjoyable fights. The Seraphims themselves are both more experienced and less experienced than the actual people who they're based off of. And I find it weird and interesting. Like these Seraphims are designed to follow specific orders, but they do have a preference. We see Boa feeling emotional, talking to Luffy. We see Mihawk with the ambition of his older self. I don't know if they would ever go against their programming per se, but maybe they would feel emotionally bad for doing something that they had to do. And all of this conversation about Seraphims has gotten me thinking about characters like Whitebeard Jr., which at first I was like, okay, I don't know why we're really introducing this guy, but now I'm starting to realize that he might be like an almost underbaked version of all of these Seraphims. He's like the version 1.0, the prototype of the Seraphim idea developed in another method. Because then I might like him more as someone who did not care about Whitebeard Jr. The realization that a lot of these characters that we've been seeing are just clones of other characters in some prototype form is fascinating. Now it is time to talk about some disappointments for me. That's right, this arc had a few disappointments for me. We're gonna start off positive. At the start of the arc, we saw Law versus Blackbeard, and throughout Egghead so far, we have occasionally peeked back into the fight to see how things were going. We saw enough to know there was a struggle, and to know that Law, to some degree, put up a good fight. And then we got Kid. Let's, let's, <clears throat> let's keep it positive still, right, Kid? landed in Elbath, which is where Shanks was, and conceptually, that had a lot of intrigue. We haven't really touched ground on Elbath since, like, Whole Cake Island. What's going on over there? We've been hyping it for so long! And then the next thing we knew, Kid was going over to Elbath to take down Shanks, and they're gonna, like, have a giant brawl again. It felt like the Law and Blackbeard thing all over again. And this could have been interesting. We could have had a drawn-out fight where we swapped between these three four parallel fights happening at the same time and then kid kid lost yeah uh, within within like a minute he lost <laughs> but only if i lose <sighs> unlike law who had five chapters where maybe he had a chance kid was a goner from the beginning kid didn't even have like a chapter to fight in and I'm not even sad that he lost. I'm just sad that there wasn't a fight. It almost feels like we were like undercutting the story. We were cutting it short, trying to not make this like a 20 plus chapter event. Kid's fight was so short that I kind of feel like it's used as a setup for yet another fight. And that's what I'm hoping for. I'm not sure if like Luffy will get like the fight or if Kid will get a, a round two, a round three now. Maybe I just want to see Kid beaten up even more. But hey, look, the arc isn't over, all right? There's still so much more to talk about. I haven't even talked about Full of Lead. I'm going to have to talk about that in the next one. So I'll put down this theory. In the Full of Lead section of the story, we have Garp and Helmepo trying to get back Kobe. And in the midst of that, I think that they're going to be the ones who, like, save Law in, like, some way. Or at least wrap up that fight against Blackbeard. And in that same way, I think we're going to parallel it to Luffy and Luffy's going to be the one who saves Kid by defeating Shanks. And so we have already built up this parallel narrative of these characters going to a different island, defeating this bad guy who has already defeated some other character. That's how I can justify the round two in my head for both of these characters, for both Law and Kid who got beat down. But frankly, we're at a point in the story where I think anything can happen. There's just so much more info, you know? I thought part three would be all of Egghead reviewed, but no, it keeps going. Oh, when will it end?